Hello and welcome to this video. Christians know that we have a wonderful message about a wonderful saviour and we long to share that message with other people. However, there are other ways of talking besides preaching and many people don't realise that we give out silent messages all the time. So this video is going to focus on how some of those silent messages may help or possibly hinder the message that we want to share. I apologise that this recording started partway through a webinar. So the first few moments were missed and then there is a, a little bit of a summing up just to try to catch up with the information. There's also reference to downloads and things like that that you cannot get on this recording. However, if you visit the website www.ruralmissionsolutions.org.uk, that's ruralmissionsolutions.org.uk, you can have a browse around and you may find some of the useful uh, downloads there. Otherwise, drop us an email and the contact de details are also uh, on the website. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you find this helpful. And if you do, please click the like button and sign up to subscribe so you get more information as other helpful videos are loaded up onto our YouTube channel. Have a look around, see what you might find. We're looking at ourselves as other people see us and often we give out uh, signals that are unhelpful. So we've talked about signals that weren't quite what people wanted to say. It's a very dirty looking sign advertising uh, meals. We would want to be seen like this, but sometimes we're seen like this. So we're going to be try and be honest and look at ourselves as others see us. And I was talking just now about how in the commercial world, uh, rebranding is done periodically and it's done for a number of reasons. But people find that it actually will increase sales by even as much as 70% if they look at their image and refresh their image. Now you may say, well, we're not a secular organization, we're a spiritual organization. But we have something, the message of the gospel that we want to share with other people, and keen to get out to other people. So in a sense, we have something that we want to market. And we're also operating within a marketplace. As far as Sundays are concerned, in expecting people to come to church, we're asking them to use their leisure time. So they're going to spend leisure time coming to us instead of going to shops or doing sport or spending time visiting family and so on. So there is a marketplace and we have something we wish to share. Well, we have been able to include uh, the video, Mr. Bean Goes to Church, just the first three minutes. Do take a look at it and as you watch it, think about what aspects are there in this video that speak into this whole subject of our image.
אדם מעז יותר או וואו? ויעלו... ואז עד באמת, אני לא יודע כלום. to leave it there um, and we're going to ask you just to reflect on that and answer a few questions what struck you most about that bear with me while I open up the poll and and send that to you okay you should be seeing the poll and uh, if you like take a moment just to reflect on those questions which struck you the most and if you select the ones and then I'll feed back uh, the results to you thank you several uh, making a start, which is great. And while you're doing that, my apologies for the technical problems we've had earlier, and also for the quality of that video. It uh, was recorded on uh, a video recorder a little while ago. It's not very, very technically good. Nearly all of you have now completed. Okay, you've all completed. Now, uh, again, we just need to close the poll, and then I can share it with you. There we go. So to give you some idea of, of, of the results of, of the poll. So most notice the lack of welcome at the door. Quite a few also noticed people were ignoring his needs. Nobody was offering him a seat. Uh, and people were just ignoring him as he walked through. Um, nobody noticed how gloomy the building was. Right? For me, I think it was very an unattractive situation, a very gloomy building. Uh, quite a few noticed that there were no smiles, um, and and uh, the fact that people ignored his his need, that he wasn't offered a handkerchief, although he's in a crisis situation. So anyway, there we are. Interesting how we respond to these situations. So let's deal with the issue of welcome, and uh, I want to ask questions. Why do we want to give people a welcome? How do we do it, and who do we use for it? Now. Time is short, but you'll find in the downloads, which you have information documents, including one which is talking about how to give a better welcome. Now, presumably the answer to the question why is simple. We want people to feel that they are welcome, that this is a friendly place, that we're glad that they have come. But how do we do it? Is it just a handshake on the door and a few books thrust into their hand? Is that all that happens? Do we welcome the regulars differently to the way we might welcome somebody who's coming for the first time? How do we handle people coming for the first time? Ought they to know where the toilets are? Are there other things that we should explain about the service? And, and who do we use to do this welcome? Now, some people have a real gift of hospitality and others don't, but that person on the door, is that a person who's got a gift of hospitality? Is it somebody who welcomes visitors into their home, who knows how to put people at their ease? If not, we're not using the right people, so we ought to think in terms of who we're using as well as why we do it and how we do it. And I want to ask the question, when we talk about welcoming people, and most people will tell me that their church is a very welcoming church, but I want to ask, if we took away the word welcoming and we changed it to hospitable, is it the same? If you had a visitor to your home, how would you welcome them to your home? Somebody turns up unexpectedly, maybe on a winter's day and it's cold outside, well, you'd welcome them in. I'm sure you'd offer to take their coat and hang it up. You'd be delighted to hear why they've called on you. You'd want to know what's going on in their life at this time. They would be the focus of attention. If they've come a distance, you would probably ask them would they like to use the bathroom. If, uh, if you 
got some tea and coffee on, you'd offer them coffee, or if not, you'd make it for them. You, you'd bring them into a warm room and, and tell them where the most comfortable seat is. Uh, if the, you've got other visitors, you'd introduce them to somebody. Now, all of those things are normal hospitality, but that's not what people experience when they go to church. Worth thinking about. I asked a non-Christian artist if he would draw me a cartoon explaining why he didn't go to church. Take a few moments just to look at this. Um, Barry, Sorry, I'm aware I've just spotted that. Were you about to tell me that we were, we were high, still showing the poll? I, I do apologise. You've not missed anything else, really, uh, 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 as we've gone. But here's the cartoon. Thank you, Faith. I'm, you just caught me just as I realised what, what I'd done. What's your experience, Faith, as you've travelled around? What kind of welcome have, have you found in churches? Have you been to some good churches where the welcome's good? Yeah, I've been um, to a few different churches um, and had lots of different types of welcomings. Um, a lot of people are good at welcoming um, as you first come into the church. Um, and others are more along the hospitable side of introducing you to other people or um, making drinks. But um, I also experienced a church where um, as soon as the service started, the doors were locked. So oh. if you were late, even for a couple of minutes, you couldn't get in. Oh dear, that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah. I, went, I went to a church and... Uh, they had coffee afterwards and, and you had to queue up at a, at a hatch to get your coffee and I stood in this queue and not one person from the church had spoken to me and eventually a lady in front of me in the queue said, do you worship here regularly? And I said, no, I was a visitor. She so said, so am I. Now that was a oh. experience. I went back to that church uh, a few months ago and the whole thing was different. Uh, my wife and I shows where we were going to sit and somebody came and sat with us and I asked them afterwards do you normally sit there and she said no I came because you were visitors and I wanted to welcome you really oh, that's good. okay back to the cartoon I wonder whether we understand so the character on the left of your screen is the artist who who, who, who drew the cartoon why he didn't go to church okay and he obviously thought people were older, middle class and judgmental. How terrible is that, that people should think that? Now, while we're thinking about hospitality and how we welcome people, uh, one of the issues I want to uh, raise is, is the issue of, um, of, of our toilet facilities. Now, some churches, uh, particularly in rural areas, sadly don't have toilets, which is, uh, is a problem. Uh, but if you do, I want to ask what kind of quality is it? Uh, now, is it a clean place? Is it a warm place? Uh, have you got good hand washing facilities? Uh, have you got warm water as well as cold? Um, what kind of towels do you use? Uh, have you got a, 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 a towel that's not laundered and, and is damp? Uh, or do you use those paper towels that people have to throw away afterwards? Uh, and, and one ch church I really admired, they had bought a hundred, it was a reasonable sized church, but they bought a hundred face flannels and they used these as hand towels. They rolled them up and put them in a basket on a shelf. They looked very, very nice and tidy and very smart with a nice notice that said, once you've washed your hands, please use one of these towels and leave it in the laundry basket on the floor. And then somebody each week took, it, took them home. And that just seemed to give out a signal of quality. And one of my big bugbears is cheap toilet paper. Why do people want to buy cheap toilet paper for the church? And I wonder whether where that exists, whether the person that, that's advocating the cheapest toilet paper also uses the same quality of toilet paper at home. Often these things speak about our hospitality, really important. And what's the image your church has within the community? Most times, people seem to think the church is only interested in them in order to get them to come to services or to join them. In other words, it's about us. It's about, we're self-seeking, self-interested. We're no different from any other kind of organization in the village. We want members and we want money. Well, that's a tragedy, isn't it? Because that's not what we're here for. We're here as part of God's mission to serve the community. So how might we give out the signals that we're here to serve. How often do we arrange 
activities that are entirely for the benefit of the community. Now, it might be a concert or an exhibition. It could be a number of different things that we could do. And in one of our uh, presentations, we, we do things on seasonal aspects of mission. And that's one of the things that we have tackled there. How we might do things in order to give out the message, we are here for the benefit of the community. I'll give you one quick illustration. A church where I was the minister arranged a pudding festival. And everybody in the village was encouraged to uh, indicate what their favorite pudding was and to attend a meeting and bring a sample of their favorite pudding and the recipe. And we had a wonderful bean feast. The church provided the main course and some wine and then people provided all these puddings. We had 21 different puddings, and we put the, uh, the recipes into a book, and all of this was done as a fundraising exercise for the Air Ambulance Service, which was uh, a favorite charity in the village. So we got nothing out of it. We, we gave premises, we gave food, and did, did this event. It's giving out signals that we're here to serve rather than be served by the community. Let's take a moment to think about building issues. So often our buildings are the things that are giving out negative signals. Um, Faith talked about doors, locked doors, um, locked doors in service time. It's a gentle thing to think about that. I don't know where they, why they came to that. But anyway, church doors, why do they have to look so impenetrable? Do your doors say this is a place of welcome? Or does it say, this is a, a locked up, impenetrable place? Could you do anything about it? Um, maybe you can't change the outside doors, but could you have an internal porch and, and have that glazed? Uh, and if that's reasonably airtight, uh, then perhaps you could leave your solid doors open and just let people see in a little more frequently. In one church where we did that, um, people use the porch uh, and, and use it as a place to put nice flower display and the exhibitions. Lots of things you can do even when the church is closed if you have glazed doors. And what about those windows? Do you like stained glass windows? Well, if you've got them, you can't change them. But they don't look very inviting from the outside. Maybe at night time, if the lights are bright inside, they look okay. And on the inside, they look okay when the sun is shining. But just be aware that they look intimidating. They don't look welcoming. In the past, betting shop windows used to look very uninviting to me. I've never been in a betting shop. And they didn't look very inviting to me. And the sounds I heard didn't sound very, very good. Now, what about lighting? Why do you think supermarkets and, and shops always have bright places, use lots of light? And they do it because it's inviting. It makes it look a nice place to be. But is your church gloomy like that one that Mr. Bean went to, or is it bright and light? The other day I went to a church and I struggled to read the hymns, partly because I have a sight problem, but partly because the lighting was not on. And then what about heating? What heating do you have? Again, I'd like you to think in terms of what you expect in your home and make sure it matches what you expect in your church. Is it a comfortable place? Now, there are all sorts of issues you can talk about how to, to manage that. And, and if you have pews and, 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 and you're left with these pews, they are, of course, a Victorian invention. And uh, even Anglican churches, Catholic churches might not have had pews in the past. Um, and, and it's often a lot better people sitting regimentally one behind the other. It's a strange way of, of doing things. And the, of course, the danger is when you have pews is the congregation scatters itself all over the place. But if you can make them as comfortable as possible, that is a thing. So think about the building issue. How does your building give out signals that saying this is not a welcoming, good place? This is not a nice place to visit. Think about the building. And then here's another thought. What do you do about money in your church? Do you take up collections? There's a story about a little boy who one day was having a meal at home, a very nice meal, and he was putting 
bits of food on one side. It was probably his Sunday lunch, and he was putting bits of food on one side for the dog. And his mother called him and said, are you putting that food on one side for the dog? And he said, yes. So she said, that's your food. You must eat it up. I'll look after the dog afterwards. So rather regret, uh, regretfully, he, he started to eat up all the bits that he'd put on one side for the dog. And when the meal was finished, his mum gathered up the plates and scraped the scraps into a bowl and put it down for the dog. And the little boy got down and put his arms around the dog and said, I'm awfully sorry, he said. I wanted to give you an offering, but mum's taken up a collection instead. What are we actually signalling when we take out collections? These days, we can set up standing orders, or if you want to take up offerings, you could tell your regular members, use the offering plate or the box that's by the door when you come in, and we'll bring that down sometime in the service and, and dedicate that during the service. But if you actually pass an offering plate around, what do your visitors think? Even if you say, if you're a visitor, you don't have to do it. They feel embarrassed. They feel obligated to do it. If you come to my house for a cup of coffee or a meal, I promise not to take up a collection. You can come and have it for free because I want you to feel welcome. A few moments to think about aspects to do with communication. Now, I don't know whether in your church you use hymn books or projectors. If you use hymn books, what's the condition of your hymn books? Don't put tatty books into people's hands. You can get them repaired carefully if, you, if they're getting tired. They are expensive, but get them properly repaired, not cheaply done. And, and, but make sure that people know. And if you have a visitor and you're putting books into their hands, especially if you've got three, two or three, maybe four even books that people get given. I go to churches where that happens. Why not explain to people who you've not seen before, if you've got this hospitality team that are looking after people, they can do that. What? the books are so they know we're going to sing hymns out of these books this is the order of service and the minister will talk you through it so explain about the books and if you're going to use projection is it large enough is it clear enough are there obstacles in the way and when people are coming in you might want to say if you're using a screen um, will you be able to see what's on the screen you know and if there is a welcome sign that would be helpful people can see what the writing is like so if they have a problem, then you can help them to a seat where it'd be easier for them. So screen visibility and readability is really important. Nothing worse than finding you've come to church and your eyesight's poor and they've got the screen and it's away, away from you and you can't actually read the words. Obviously, not having too many words on a slide is also important. Maybe four or five lines is quite sufficient and you certainly need something about 40 point uh, when you're using uh, PowerPoint slides or other systems like that. And then something about the sound. Does your church have a, a sound loop system? It ought to, so that people with hearing problems feel included and there should be signage to say that you have a loop system and an announcement should be made at the beginning of the service to say that it's there and to encourage people with hearing aids to turn them to the T position so that they can hear clearly what is being said. Otherwise, sound ought to be used for reinforcement rather than amplification. It's not about making the sound that's coming from the front louder. It's about making it as if it's right close to you. So you shouldn't be getting echo and booming. And people that are going to use the microphone, whether people doing reading or intercessions, need to be trained. Some microphones are omnidirectional, that is, they pick up sound from uh, around the microphone. Some are unidirectional, you need to be right in front. And you need to know how close to be. Some people get a bit frightened and stand too far back. Others get too close and they want to hear that booming sound of the amplifier. And, and, and they're not aware that when they use words that start with a P or a B, it tends to make bombing sounds on the sound system. So some microphone training would be a great help. And then what about the language we use in church? Are we aware that we use words that people don't always understand? Even words like grace, people don't understand. And um, sometimes we need to be thoughtful about what we're saying. What is it we're trying to get across? What is the message we're trying to communicate? 
And are we using language that the people on the street, people who've never been to church before, would know? Now, the people who are your regulars won't mind if you're using more normal language. They won't mind less at all. But people who come for the first time or just beginning to come, they'll find that so much more helpful. They'll get into the life of the church much easier if you're careful about the language. And don't make assumptions that they know who Moses is or who Abraham is or who Peter is. Sometimes these things need to be explained. Think about how you can use your verbal communication. And then while we're thinking about that, we could think in terms about how many people you're using to do Bible readings, notices and intercessions. Have you ever wondered why on television news programs they always have two presenters for these things? And for other programs as well, they use two presenters. And sometimes somebody else who will come in to do the weather or the sport. And the reason is that by changing the voice, we keep the interest. Now, you're listening to my voice all the time. So it's nice to have a change and, and, and have a different voice. And, and, and to actually have more than one person. So, so as to prove it, I'm going to ask Faith to come in again. Faith, Bible readings, notices and intercessions. Um, what's your view about the difference between one person doing it and maybe sharing it with two people. Is that um, yeah, definitely um, to use different voices because um, I think a lot of the time people's um, attention span isn't that long and if there's different voices then um, it kind of just makes it a bit more interesting for people to listen to or to um, even to look at if there's some a different person up at the front, it's di a different person, a different um, face, different voice, um, makes it a bit more interesting for people to pay attention a little bit more. Now lots of churches of course do get somebody from the congregation to do the Bible readings or the intercessions, but it's not just about that, it's actually, as Faith is saying, you, if you get more than one person, it, it can make it more interesting, it can add some drama. And, and I want to ask, the Bible readings in your churches, how are they done? Do they sound exciting? You've got lots of exciting stories in the Bible, and then people stand up and read it in the most boring form. And notices, people tend to switch off and notices. Um, and, uh, but by having maybe different people uh, sharing in the notices, it would keep interest. And again, for intercessions. So think about getting more than one voice. And again, it makes it attractive and more interesting. And you're giving out signals in all sorts of ways about how you do things and that you value other people. It's not just about one person leading everything all the time and that person being more important than anybody else. Do you use a church hymn board? And how visible is it from the back? Now, visitors often sit at the back because they don't know where to sit and make their way to the back. And, and, and would they be able to see the board? And, and do you rely too much on that, or do you clearly give out the numbers? Now, the best way, obviously, is to say, our next hymn is number 207, and say what the hymn is, all things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, and then repeat the number, it's 207. And if you've given out more than one book, which book are you singing from? I go to churches where I'm given perhaps mission praise, but also uh, uh, the denominations book, maybe, uh, I don't know, it might be a congregational praise or a Methodist hymn book or whatever, and you're given more than one book. So do be careful if you're saying we're going to sing hymn, give people time to find the hymn, and not only announce which book, but hold up the book so that you can see. I have to say, there's one church I, ha I, I, I attend periodically, and... Um, and every time they, they give out a hymn, I seem to miss the first verse because I'm struggling to find which book we're singing from and what the number really is. So think about that. It's just ways of making people feel more comfortable when they come. Now, <clears throat> we could get into a controversy talking about the issue of music. I don't know whether you use a group or whether you use an organ. Um, obviously, they give out different signals, don't they? If you're using various musicians, you're saying about something about people's gifts and talents and, and valuing those, but you're also saying probably something about the fact that you're a contemporary and even using 
uh, various instruments uh, for traditional hymns is still that's fine and you can do that you doesn't have to use just because you have a band you don't have to always sing the latest songs but what about the organ I learned an interesting fact I learned that uh, in the days when people used to buy uh, recorded music uh, from shops that five percent of the people who bought recorded music bought recorded classical music only 5%, 1 in 20. And of those who bought classical music, only 5%, 1 in 20, bought organ music. So the number of people that like the organ are very few, but they might be the majority in your church. But it's not a generally popular instrument outside. And really, it does need to be played well. You can play modern uh, contemporary songs on, on an organ perfectly well it can be done but sometimes it's done horribly badly so think about what instrument you use what signal you're giving out what are you saying and of course the thing people associate organs often with being very churchy it's saying something about our culture as being distinct from other culture in the context in which we are operating uh, I, Barry, yes um, I just want to mention something about the music as well. I visited one church where the piano was at the very back of the congregation and was leading the music from the back. Um, and that was actually really difficult to follow it because it was quite hard to hear because it was coming from behind you and it wasn't very loud. And I think it's important to... Um, they didn't want the music to be like a performance, so that's why they decided to put it at the back. But it's actually really difficult to follow where it was going and there was nobody at the front who is leading the music um, and I think that's quite an important thing as well. Yeah, thank you for adding that. That's, that's, that, that's helpful. I mean, the point about we ought to look at every aspect of the life of our church, both when we're meeting and when we're not meeting, and make sure that uh, it's giving out the right signals. What signals does your church give out with regard to refreshments? Now, a lot of churches now offer tea or coffee after services, and that's a good thing. Is it something that's an add-on, or do you actually do it as part of the service, part of the meeting? Why you've come together is not just to listen to a sermon, but to have fellowship, to give hospitality to one another. And what are you saying if you're using cheap plastic material and, and, and so on, rather than nice cups and saucers or mugs? And what kind of quality is your coffee? Now, if you use it correctly, this is a great opportunity for making people feel important and, and listening to what they have to say. So you can use this for a pastoral time very, very helpfully. Uh, it, but you need to gear people up so that they know that's that's what it what it's for. So allow people to feel comfortable. I want to come back on this issue of hospitality and using the right people. Now, if you're a small church, you may only find that you've got one person you can use and you can say well look after the hospitality not just the welcome but look after everybody you know this is your ministry to make people feel at home and welcome and appreciated in a larger church you could set up a team and and and, and have people so if you've got people who are all part of this hospitality ethos it makes a world of difference and it gives out a good clear signal of of what the gospel is about. The gospel is about hospitality. The gospel is about welcome. The gospel is about valuing. So all of those things we need to say, everything we do needs to have integrity with the message we share. Now we're moving to a close, but just two other points I want to talk about. One is notice boards and the other is church magazines. Let's start with the notice boards. Now I wonder what your church notice board looks like. I've seen all sorts. This is a quite an interesting one. Uh, it's actually got quite clear indication of what's happening on different Sundays. Uh, Anglican churches tend to sort of have a variety of different services on each Sunday. But it's good to have something which clearly spells out what is actually happening. And if you've got a church notice board, is it black? And has it got Gothic lettering? What are you saying if you use Gothic lettering on your notice board? You're saying you're anachronistic. You're saying it's old fashioned. Think about how your notice board looks. Shop window is really how you need to think. What message is it giving out? Now, um, on a visit to Scotland, I passed a church that had a notice board which was small and plain, and it said, 
the word of God is proclaimed here every Sunday, I think it said every Lord's Day at 11, and that's all it said, and it looked most unattractive. But next to it was a nightclub, and the nightclub had pictures of lots of young people having meals and dancing and doing things, and it looked warm and inviting. They were careful on choosing the colours. Uh, the one we're looking at at the moment is using black on white. Well, I'm sure they they really had thought about their posters, but why couldn't they use a little bit of colour and a little more illustration? They put pictures of the church, but why not find other pictures that illustrate what goes on in the church? Don't have too much clutter on your notice board. It's untidy. I think this one's quite good. Uh, from this one, <clears throat> you get some idea of uh, the theological position of the church, the ethos of the church. It states what activities are on and makes it quite clear. It's uncluttered. So it's really quite useful. And there's a contemporary poster as well advertising a harvest activity. So very, very helpful to think about the image that you're giving of your church by what people see when they look at your notice board. Think lettering and colouring and illustrations. A little bit more on your magazine. Uh, church magazines irritate me enormously. Uh, usually they give out all the wrong signals. Uh, the cover doesn't look attractive. It doesn't make you want to pick it up. Now, people that have commercial magazines have the concept that if this was sitting on a coffee table, would you want to pick it up? So look at the cover and think about that. Does it look as if it's something you would want to pick up? And what do you actually put into it? Now, you need to think about why, why you are having the magazine. What's it for? Now, sadly, some churches do it in order to raise funds. So it's chock a block with advertising, start to finish, advertising, advertising, advertising. And you have to look for the information that you might want. Now, I'm not sure that you're giving out a very good signal. If that's your church magazine, you're just saying we're after money. You know, that's not what it's about. So think about what actually goes into your magazine. And with regard to the content, um, when you first open it, a lot of church magazines I look at, almost the first thing that you see is a list of services. And again, there are language issues. It's the seventh service after Sunday, after some strange name. It doesn't mean anything to people. So avoid using churchy jargon in your magazine. OK, watch out at the language. OK, be careful about it. And if you've got a letter from the vicar or the minister, Make sure that's really inviting and accessible and, and not too esoteric or, or theological. OK, why are you producing a magazine? Now, if it's for your members, that's fine. You've got information that you want to share with your members. You can share it almost in any way that you like. But if it's going out to the public, if people in the public are seeing, you must think about content and style. Think about the layout and advertising. Try to avoid church magazines that, that, that are full of advertising. It's fine to give out information, but <clears throat> if it looks as if you're just 90% of this magazine is advertising, it's giving out the wrong signals. Now, I hope that all we've shared has been helpful. I apologize we started late and uh, it's been somewhat hurried. There is a contact that you can see. I'll leave that up in a few moments. I want to come back to the handouts. I don't know, Faith, whether anybody uh, did ask any questions. Do we have any questions from anybody that we can deal with? Uh, no, there's no questions at the moment. If um, anybody has any questions at the, right now, that they can send it in. Okay, you've still got a moment to do that. Also, you could send any questions to us and we'd be pleased to hear from you. Again, my apologies that <coughs> the quality of this particular um, presentation has been spoiled partly because of technical problems that caused an enormous delay and then that impacted in other ways later on. Again, um, if you're watching this on the video, you won't be able to do the downloads, but if, you have, if you're watching it live, remember the downloads, uh, the handouts are there. Click on the link on the left hand side of the word handout and that will reveal them and you can click on the handouts and, and download those. They'll go to your download folder okay so um, do, do use those if you miss those and you're watching this on a video drop us a line we'll send you the handouts they will actually be on the website 
rurallissionssolutions.org.uk. So rurallissionssolutions.org.uk for the handouts. And you'll find sections there. Now we have a number of other webinars and one coming up at the end of this month on Saturday 29th. And um, Gordon Banks and I will be talking about mission ideas for the winter. Now this is the third in the series where we've been encouraging people to think about the season and the main activities at this time of year and how to do a mission that ties in and relates with what's going on in the world around and all of that. So really helpful. People who saw <clears throat> the one for, for summer said it was particularly helpful. People that saw the one for autumn were um, almost over the top with their praise and comments of appreciation. So we're now preparing one for winter. It'll be on Saturday the 29th. We will send out information and it will be on the websites and it will be on Facebook. So I'm just going to go back to the contact information and to say thank you. Thank you, Faith, for sharing with us today. It's been good to have some input from you and to know that you were there to pick things up when I had made mistakes. <laughs> yeah, it's been good to be here. Thank you. Okay, so thank you from the two of us for being here and sharing with us today. Uh, we're going to say goodbye and God bless and turn our microphones off and leave you looking at this screen in case you want that contact information and you have about three or four minutes just to download uh, the uh, handouts and, and, and receive those. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for bearing with us through all the problems that we've inflicted on you because of the technical difficulties today. So goodbye, God bless, have a great day at church tomorrow. <laughs>